Good evening. My name is Kate Orff. I'm director of the Urban Design Program here at Columbia. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to GSAP and the 2019 Urban Design Lecture. I'm so pleased and honored to introduce Jesse Le Cavalier this evening. Although Jesse is not a full-time teacher at Columbia, I can say emphatically that he is a friend of the school, having taught workshops and being a frequent invited critic on reviews. He's also really a friend of the urban design program. His work, particularly around logistics and infrastructure, has upended conventional notions of power and placemaking, and even the role of civic society vis-a-vis -vis corporations and you'll see in his lecture, like Walmart, Amazon, and others, since through his research, he's tracked their vast territorial and energy imprints. Jesse's an award-winning designer, writer, and educator. He's the author of The Rule of Logistics, Walmart and the, Ar Walmart and the Architecture of Fulfillment, and he's an associate professor at the University of Toronto. He was a recipient of the New Faculty Teaching Award from the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture in 2015, a Sanders Fellow at University of Michigan, a Poesis Fellow at the IPK at NYU, and a researcher at the Singapore Etaha Future Cities Lab. His work and research has been supported by the Graham Foundation, the New York State Council for the Arts, the, and the BMW Foundation, among many others. On another note, um, we're also just so appreciative that Jesse was able to spend time with our urban design students in the studio this afternoon. And just um, before I give the podium over to him, at the end of the lecture, I'm really excited about this kind of pre-lecture um, reception and wine. We'll also have a lecture and, uh, excuse me, a reception uh, at the end of the lecture, after the lecture outside in Brownies, and I'll be facilitating a, a Q&A exchange so please be prepared with your questions uh, and, and be prepared to engage Jesse at the end of the session. Thank you, welcome to Columbia. Thanks, Kate. Um, what a great introduction. It's, it's really my uh, pleasure to be here. And um, I, I feel quite lucky to be able to be counted as a, a friend of the Urban Design Program. So I'm really, um, I can't tell you enough how uh, grateful I am for the invitation and also uh, for the chance to share some of the, the work with you. Um, and certainly, since there's wine back there, that will make the lecture much more fun, so I don't, won't discourage you. Um, as Kate mentioned, my, my work uses the tools of urban design and architecture to research and theorize and, and speculate about infrastructure. And of course, I'm not working alone in this, and it's especially an honor to be here tonight amongst friends and collaborators and mentors. There are certainly people at GSAP who have been incredibly influential for me, and there's, um, I wouldn't be able to do what I've been doing uh, without their work, so it's especially meaningful to be here tonight. Um, so I've organized the talk tonight into three parts. The first are three observations about infrastructure, which I'd like to use as a way to frame a larger urban uh, discussion around this, this broad topic of what we might think of as infrastructure. Um, then as a way to share some parts of my book, some uh, some claims about logistics, 10 claims about logistics, and then finally uh, to make some links to the, from the research side of my practice to the design side, uh, three projects that deal with the first two. So three observations about infrastructure, 10 claims about logistics, and then three projects. So infrastructure, of course, in the news, something that we hear about a lot. Um, infrastructure week is this thing that the Trump administration keeps trying to do as a way to develop the one bipartisan issue that everyone seems to understand is really important, and yet it keeps getting upended by various forms of political theater. And yet the president continues to assert that he wants to do infrastructure, and he wants to do it more than you want to do it. Um, but it raises a question of what does it mean to do infrastructure, and how do we do it, and what do we even mean by it? So the Trump plan has a familiar, actually, more generous than you might guess, de expanded definition of the, the term. They, they describe it as a plan that addresses more than traditional infrastructure, i.e. roads, bridges, and airports, but addresses other needs like drinking and wastewater systems, waterways, water resources, energy, rural infrastructure, public lands, veterans hospitals, and brownfield and Superfund sites, which actually sounds sort of surprisingly not, not so bad. But, um, 
But thanks to recent work on this topic, especially happening here through the Buell Center, through the Urban Design Program, through the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes, we understand that infrastructure even so is much more than even those things, and it has to do with this much broader understanding of infrastructure as not just physical elements, but also uh, social systems and the various forms of soft power that link, link all of these pieces together. So, our understanding of infrastructure has expanded to include both our understanding of its agency and our understanding of what it is. So in other words, it, it, ha it does a range of things and it also is a range of things. And so here is just a string of statements about infrastructure from a range of thinkers on the topic that I won't really elaborate on, but want to just quickly offer as a sort of um, preview somehow for some of these issues. So infrastructure is a large technical system. Infrastructure is a bureaucratic tool. Infrastructure is a territorial instrument. Infrastructure is a medium of global polity. Infrastructure is a conduit for power. And we could use civic works here, actually, uh, for infrastructure also, but I think thinking of it in infrastructure keeps it in the sort of broadest uh, category. It, so infrastructure also does things. It mediates, it repeats, it distributes, it connects and separates, it generates friction, it offshores, it conditions imagination. We might even say it sim more simply, that logistics is the board, not the pieces. And really significantly, infrastructure is something that we can design. And this is what I want to try to get to a little bit uh, tonight. So on the screen is a, an art project, a piece from uh, Gustavo Artigas called Rules of the Game, in which two American basketball teams and two Mexican soccer teams are playing each other at the same time on the same court. And I like this project when thinking about infrastructure because while both sets of, of lines are present and it allows both games to happen, but because they're happening simultaneously, some new thing emerges as these systems put, put pressure on each other. So even if infrastructure is designed, uh, it's difficult to access. And one wonders maybe why that is. So I think there's a few uh, things about that that I can try to unpack a little bit. One is that infrastructures, of course, as we said, are more than just their physical elements. These observations are also, I should say, they're kind of ambiguous. Like some, it might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing. So for example, uh, infrastructures are diffusely authored. It's hard to sort of say this infrastructure is by a certain person. And I think in a way, this is actually positive because it puts emphasis on a collective uh, understanding of these. But at the same time, the process by which infrastructure gets made becomes really opaque. And then the last observation is that infrastructures tend to be under-imagined and under-theorized. And of course, um, there are exceptions in, in, uh, to this, and, and many of the exceptions are in this uh, building and room, but I think this is something that we can continue to work on uh, expanding our, our ability to understand what infrastructure can and do. So as an example of the first observation that, that infrastructure is part of a much larger uh, system, I turn to a trusted archival source, the, the Yelp Review. Uh, and this is, uh, as part of my own work, I find myself in sort of funny corners of the internet and things like uh, Yelp reviews of Walmarts become actually really, really illuminating sources for how people understand uh, and react to their environment. And when I was collecting some of these about various Walmarts, certain idiomatic expressions keep coming up. One of those is the phrase, get on the ball, which I always thought was a sports expression um, used here, basically people saying like, these managers have to get on the ball and organize their store better because they're losing money or they're losing my business or something like that. But um, this phrase, get on the ball, to understand where it comes from, we actually have to go back to the United States in the 1880s. Which, so in 1883, the US adopted standard time, uh, and this was to coordinate times with the railroads because basically the network of lines, this is the Michigan and Lakeshore line, these were, this was this dense tangle of railroads, all of which had their own systems, their own even their own time. So Chicago time might be different than, than um, Buffalo time. And so this, you can imagine, posed a number of problems. So even if standard time was adopted in 1883, it took some time to work out the kinks. And one of these uh, kinks was the, this so-called Great Kipton Wreck, which was a collision between two trains in uh, 1891 in Kipton, Ohio. And it occurred because one of the engineer's watches had stopped for four minutes. So to deal with this, the railroad officials commissioned this Cleveland watchmaker as their chief time inspector in order to not just develop a timepiece, but also to establish precision standards 
and a reliable inspection system for what they called railroad chronometers. This led to the adoption in 1893 of stringent standards for pocket watches, uh, and these railroad grade pocket watches became, they had to meet the general railroad timepiece standards adopted in 1893. So uh, why am I talking about this? This, na this man's name was Webster C. Ball. So to be on the ball meant to have the standard timepiece and to be in sync with the large system of railroad traffic management. So the claim here from the watchmakers is that without the watch, the railroad system would have become increasingly unsafe, inefficient, and less profitable. But this also highlights the fact that any infrastructural system is more than just the physical stuff. It's not just the rails, it's not just the railroad line, it's not just the ties, it's also the combination of regulations and standards and technologies and people and relationships that all help this thing sort of move forward, what we might call a large socio-technical system. Um, and with it, a new kind of territorial imagination emerged. So this was a map of the US showing distance in terms of time. And so you can see there's no railroads drawn here, but you can still see where the railroads would be going because of the speed by which uh, you can reach things. And, and what this starts to reveal is the priorities uh, for certain places. So you can see you can get to Chicago more quickly uh, from New York than you can to certain parts that are more physically proximate. And this is because the very, of the various kinds of imbalances and also privilege, privileging of certain sites because of their connectedness to a market, for example, uh, or to, to other sort of infrastructural systems. And so forces like power and finance and political structures and geography, all of these play a role in the way that, that infrastructural systems take shape. Infrastructural systems are built and engineered, but as I said, these are, I think it's important to remember that these are also designed. And it's not maybe a controversial statement to say that infrastructure is designed, but I think it's important to remind ourselves that people are behind this. It's not just sort of, it doesn't just happen. Um, but because of the scale and the complexity, infrastructural systems like these, like the ones I've been talking about, tend to seem authorless. And as a result, I think visions and alternatives become secondary to the financial and political necess necessity to complete something. So I think what happens, what can happen is design agency and public agency can both wither because of this sort of opacity and this distance. What the priorities become questions of how and why more than what or who and a passive cycle of preferential attachment sets in by which those who implement infrastructure tend to keep doing so. So for example, on the screen here are some of those organizations implementing infrastructure. These are, this is from the, um, the journal Engineering News Record, which I highly recommend. Uh, this is the top 20 design firms by sector, and you can see the sectors are maybe not what you'd expect. So industrial uh, process and petroleum, that's the largest design sector. Transportation, general building is number three. Then it goes down power, hazardous waste, water, sewer and waste design. So these are all um, design sectors according to this. And if you add all that up, it adds up to a $94 billion industry. Uh, but then only half of that, the top 20 firms make up half of that, and then the top five make up a quarter of that. And then you can see a company like Jacobs dominates this already. So you have this sort of small sector of organizations basically busy building the world's infrastructure. But we know that infrastructure is at the heart of our contemporary challenges like climate, migration, environmental justice, food distribution, waste management, uh, just to name a few. And as infrastructure remains a site of collective investment, it could, I think, with optimism, remain a public thing. It could be, once again, a civic thing. Although, if it continues to be imagined only as a way to solve what might be called tame problems, we will remain, I think, where we are. And I think this is where, um, predictably, even though the Trump plan has an expanded definition of infrastructure, it actively promotes the status quo through the appeal to private sector infrastructural development. It's sort of a thinly veiled, uh, barely veiled uh, appeal to, or, or proposal to basically make it very easy to privatize uh, infrastructure. And it also puts a lot of pressure on uh, state funding when there's not that funding there. So on the other hand, and this is why it's been, it was really inspiring today to be with the Urban Design Group, the Green New Deal right, rightfully points to the need for structural change and massive structural change and urgent structural change. But infrastructurally, the focus remains on the technological fixes with 
I think, less at attention to some of these software systems and behavior related to infrastructure. So as my final example in this first part, I want to um, just tell one story about how infrastructure might be reimagined. And infrastructures tend to be generally sort of underspecified systems capable of being read and used and appropriated in a range of ways. So as an example, we have to go to Sweden in the 1960s. Before 1967 in Sweden, motorists used the left lane, like in England, uh, but to many this condition raised a number of regulatory and safety and commercial concerns. Uh, a resolution was passed and initiated the process uh, and included this kind of intensifying media campaign. There were, there were pop songs, there was like a Eurovision equivalent song contest uh, that I will spare you, uh, but, but find me after, I'm happy to share it. It's in the archives. Um, various logos, these kind of serious looking figures here explaining that you've changed sides, but it all worked. Basically this escalating uh, campaign ended on September 3rd when at 4.50 in the morning, everyone changed sides. And it worked without, there were no accidents, everything went smoothly and basically everyone just started driving on the other side of the road. And I think for me what this, this little example is a reminder that infrastructural use is not a given, but it's something that we constantly renegotiate or enroll ourselves into a voluntary process of, of cooperation. And I think that if we extend this as a kind of parable, it gives us a way to think about how we might rethink how we use infrastructure, what infrastructure might be more fundamentally, uh, that it's something that we can reconceptualize really um, entirely. So with all that in the background, I'd like to offer 10 claims about logistics as a way of thinking about some of the forces at work that are shaping architecture and urbanism. And these are related to my own, uh, the, the research in the book. And they're, the 10 that I've gathered here are some of the kind of, I think for me, the very kind of significant pieces of the story. And they're all interrelated. And this is the kind of overview here. They're, they all describe a multi-scalar network that connects something as small as the barcode to bodies working in these warehouses, to the buildings that are connected to each other, to transformations at the scale of the planet being wrought by the data industry. So this is, once again, a techno-social spatial entanglement that we can call logistics. So, but first, what do we even mean when we ask about logistics? It's the, this area of work, this body of knowledge, this site of design related to the supply chain and supply chain management which could lead us to ask, what is the supply chain? So the supply chain uh, generally is accepted to have been defined in the early 80s by this management consulting company, Booz Allen. And this is the, term, the, the definition they offer. The supply chain is the sequence of events that occurs from after the procurement of raw material through to delivery to the final customer, which from maybe our perspective here 40 years later sounds somewhat quaint because we know for example, when something like IKEA is buying forests to oversee the production of raw material and then any given smart product is sending user data back to their company, we know that the supply chain is longer and longer and more entangled with every aspect of our daily life. Logistics makes the world work better. When it's planes in the sky for a chain of supply, that's logistics. When the parts for the line come precisely on time, that's logistics. A continuous link that is always in sync, that's logistics. Carbon footprint reduced, bottom line gets a boost, that's logistics. With new ways to compete, there'll be cheers on Wall Street, that's logistics. So uh, an advertisement from UPS by Olivia Mether from a few years ago uh, as part of their We Heart Logistics campaign. Um, a whole lecture could be devoted to that uh, commercial in terms of what it says about the urban and the logistical. But I wanna just focus on one uh, screen capture here, which is the heart and the barcode together. 
uh, the data and love simultaneously, speed and affect being combined. This gets to the core of this entanglement and dual meaning of uh, fulfillment. And also to just sort of reiterate the first claim at the beginning of this advertisement that logistics makes the world work better. Um, we'll see about that. Um, but the book, uh, The Rule of Logistics, uses one particular actor to tell uh, this bigger story, hopefully to try to understand the impact that logistics is having on buildings and bodies and territory. And that actor is Walmart, um, which is one of the largest logistical players in the world and also one of the largest corporations. Uh, annual revenue last year of $500 billion, um, followed not so closely by the state grid and then Sinopec. Uh, so, so what does it mean when a, when a retailer a company that builds a lot of buildings is the largest corporation in the world, followed only by giant state-run infrastructure companies or petroleum companies. It might make us think that maybe Walmart is not a retailer. Maybe they actually are also an infrastructure provider, which actually might get closer to the truth in some way. If you had to locate it in terms of GDP, they'd be somewhere between Sweden and Poland. And then if you remember that that $94 billion figure from the AEC industry, uh, is then dwarfed by Walmart's $500 billion revenue. So consider that the entire architecture, engineering, construction industry is a quarter, a, a, a fifth of what Walmart uh, does. If I stay, um, by the time I'm finished, if I stay on time, uh, the family will have earned another $4 million. I thought about having a little like Walmart tracker, like how much money are they earning while I'm talking. Um, but this is the remaining Waltons. These are, the, this is the richest, one of the world's richest, richest families. Um, and they inherited the business from their father, Sam Walton, which is also a, a kind of other lecture. But I want, this is an animation describing the, the company's growth. So for those of you who don't know, Walmart is headquartered uh, stubbornly in this remote corner of, it's not so remote, but it's a, it's a, it's a corner of Arkansas that, that until um, 20 years ago, you couldn't fly to directly from New York. You had to fly to Little Rock and then connect. So, so, um, but the Alice Walton wing has made it possible to get there um, more quickly. But what you see is what's happening is basically all the blue dots are, are stores and all the red dots are distribution centers. And you see a few patterns emerging. One is that the, the stores grow concentrically. Uh, and then as the stores grow, red dots appear. And that's basically, imagine that the blue dots are building up pressure, the red dots are relieving pressure. And that pressure is a distribution pressure to be able to get goods to the right stores at the right time. And then you see along the top here, for example, this is a, a, one of the interstates, that there's this incredibly precise rhythm of stores. These are, of course, calibrated to be um, a certain distance apart, four hours by car. And of course, like every corporation, every, every company who builds stores will have precision to their locational logic, but Walmart is unique in its size and scope and reach, and this was why, for me, it seemed like a good uh, uh, area of study for a book about logistics. And so this map with um, each of these red dots as a, as a distribution center um, brings me to my first claim, which is that the barcode makes things into information also. So in other words, it makes things into information, but the things are still things. And so there's this kind of persistence of the logistical logic that deals with the physicality of stuff, but also produces an informational double to move it around. And so the barcode, um, as you are familiar, you know what a barcode is, but just, I love this image because it actually is a pre-digital image of a barcode with someone actually composing it into a series of bars. So the bars are the black and white ones and zeros that are scanned to then translate a code into a computer language. And barcodes are unique because they were the first machine readable symbol written by machines for machines. So for us to read them, we need to decode it. But the, the computers, they know how to read them. So this is part of the challenge. One of the other things that, that the Barco did is that they, they changed the way that inventory was managed in these companies. So they, 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 they help record inventory, but they also help a store better understand what people are buying. And if this, was, this would happen in an analog way before, but this has become intensified through something like the barcode. So simply by taking something off the shelf, bringing it to a cash register, getting it scanned, you as a shopper are basically becoming a stockist and a market analyst because you're telling the store what uh, what they need to put more of on the shelf. So consumer behavior, of course, notoriously fickle, and the barcode helps to manage risk by predicting what consumers will want. So on one hand, the barcode helps to generate 
large amounts of information about buying habits in fast and inexpensive ways, uh, but it also allows for multiple systems to interact with it and with low barriers to entry. So it's this very kind of powerful symbol because it's kind of um, simple and, and a little, um, uh, it has a kind of loosely coupled power to it. So um, this is an early diagram of where you should put the, the Walmart, oh, sorry, the barcode. Um, I should add that the, 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 the barcode was implemented in 1974. By 1976, over 75% of all products had one on it. So it was a rapidly adopted system. And I love this diagram, this drawing, because it takes all of the stuff of marketing and reduces it just to where you should put a barcode, because that's all the information that the retailers really care about, uh, because this is how you enter it into a logistical regime. So in the same way that, that the barcode takes an object and makes it information, it does that also to the environment. It makes environment and inventory the same thing. It abstracts them and lets them become managed. And so this is a, a, a drawing from a journal called Army Logistician of a warehouse base. And I think what's really key here is that the inventory, the stuff, the, the the forklift is moving around is drawn in the exact same way that the building is drawn. And what this does is, is I think, signal for me a, a way of seeing the world in which everything becomes a point to be managed and optimized. And this happens uh, with Walmart's locational strategies, for example, where they use mapping software and al predictive algorithms to, to understand where they should build a new store. And they can encumber the real estate. They can start the construction process all remotely from their headquarters in Bentonville based on performance criteria and property metrics. So, so this level of abstraction goes from the object to the building all the way to the territory. And as a result, buildings are deployed as territorial instruments. So they're not necessarily just a building on a corner. These things become part of a much larger system that is closely calibrated in terms of, of, of growth mandates. And so the, these are, this is the same map just inverted. I think it's, you can see the distribution center is a bit easier. These are the blue dots. And each of those blue dots might look something like this. This is in Apple Valley, California. So this is um, around a million square feet of, of interior and then the same again for parking. And you can see it sort of nests here into the ordinance grid and then this is a runway just to give you a little bit of a scalar comparison. So these are massive uh, assemblies. And what is significant for me in terms of a territory question is these are also the little stars here. So these things become the, the anchor for a territory that is superimposed over state boundaries. And, and so today, for example, in the urban design studio, we were talking about different, different logics of territorial organization. I think for me, this is a really powerful one because it, it supersedes those pesky political boundaries that in a way are quite strange in the West. It's like, why is Wyoming a square? Um, I don't know if anyone's in Jimenez's studio, but I know this is part of that question. But here you have this kind of like much more fluid thing, and this is based on delivery times and interstate, uh, interstate logics and delivery systems. And, and not, it's not so uh, unrelated to um, these earlier imaginations of territory that would be linked to resource allocation. So on the left, this is a Pow Powell's map about um, a potential reorganization around the Colorado River watershed. On the right, the logistical here hard at work in which the land and the political are superseded by the non-observable metrics like um, delivery time. So in other words, things like state borders, mountains, these are sort of overcome by the logics of, of delivery. So those fulfillment centers that are the anchors for those amorphous, constantly changing shapes are not uh, warehouses in the way we might think of them. They're more like relays or switches. They take in a vast amount of stuff and then they redirect it. So the, while the dream of logistics, I would say, is to eliminate inventory altogether, to suspend it in a, in a kind of constant flow from producer to consumer, the current state demands still that we have points of storage and redirection, and that's in the form of these large, mostly flat buildings. And even building isn't really quite the right term for it because it's really this tangle of conveyance systems and shelving and, and belts, and the architectural expression is only the most sort of minimal of enclosures, this kind of thin membrane that is just sort of the least amount that's necessary to enclose this giant machine, this giant processor, which is, if you imagine, um, so when I visited one of these, the, the manager on duty told me that they, it turns over 20, in 24 hours. But it's impossible to tell because you just look at this a shelf full of stuff, it never seems to empty. But imagine um, filling your bathtub up and then turning the water on and pulling out the plug, 
the, the level won't really change, but all of this material is sort of moving through there. It's a bit like what's happening uh, here. So these increasingly mechanical environments are full of these encrypted surfaces, basically um, blind uh, for, for the poor humans who are sort of finding their way in here, but the barcode is the thing that's sort of organizing all of it. And, and in this photo, you do see the one, there's a conspicuous absence of bodies in here, the one human. Um, it's hard to find any others. Um, this is a, also a longer story about the role of, of bodies in here. Um, and indeed, the fulfillment center's intensity of information and speed requires uh, human augmentation to cope. So uh, augmentation of vision and knowledge through these prosthetic and extending technologies, in this case a wearable uh, scanner that basically makes the scanner part of your body. Um, augmentations of mobility in which workers in these spaces are uh, inhabiting movable cranes that move you up and down, back and forth through the, the racks, or augmentations of speed and strength where people driving uh, pallet trucks are loading up and unloading these movable volumes, which from here just seem like rooms in the warehouse, but of course are the trucks that are being loaded and then brought to the, the awaiting supercenter. All of this is described as a lean operation, or a just-in-time operation, but in order to make this lean, it requires a substantial amount of surplus, of slack, of, of even flab, if you want. Um, so this is a family of Walmarts outside of Phoenix, and you can see they kind of share traits, but they're not exactly the same. So this was actually one of the kind of early motivating questions for this research was, how does a company build so many stores so quickly? They build, on average, um, three a week. And so there has to be a system to make this really expedient. And one of the ways they do that is through a kind of strategic underspecification. So this is a typical title block where, um, yeah, exactly, store number XXX, job number XXXXXX, but prototype 143 tells you the whole story. And that's what this is. This is prototype 143, designed for no place in particular, but ready to be instantiated uh, at almost a moment's notice. So the features of a new location combined with the research about demographics and real estate, those all determine which prototype to choose. And then while the, while the interiors are highly specified, things like the exterior, the site orientation, their access to infrastructure, all of that has to be modified in the field by a local architect or contractor. They call this site adapt. So as a result, the task of design has more to do with developing an interface with an unknown condition and then playing out the scenarios of transformation for a given scenario. And so that's what this is. This is a drawing, uh, for example, of the prototype on top, which is the blue one, and then the three instances of that. So then when you overlay them all, you see the kind of variability that happens at the envelope level, even though the internal logic is fairly stable. And so this breeds a kind of um, a family of these sort of slightly unstable forms where they're all kind of the same, but also all a little bit different. And all of this is about a certain kind of uh, data hunger. So if you think about that edge of the building that I was just showing you, arguably the edge of the building is actually not that membrane, but here, this, this digital border where you, as a customer, scan your products and then are allowed to leave the store because you've traded money for them. And this is this malleable crust that forms the building's edge, but I think when the, the, the place where the data is gathered is a really significant boundary because it triggers all of the replenishment protocols that the distribution centers support. So Walmart certainly is data ravenous. They are um, responsible, according to one study from Harvard, responsible for 2.4% of the world's data. And this is, imagine, so if you are encountering this many millions of customers every day at this many thousands of stores, you are generating this preposterous amount of data. All of that has to go somewhere. So that's all managed by their data centers, which is, this is one example, built outside of Bentonville. And so compared to, well, basically Walmart's building suggests a more of an alignment with infrastructure. It's built to disappear, it's rendered to be illegible, it's buried in the ground because of the, the need for cooling. So this massive earthen berm, you can, this is the entrance. So a person is about, so you sort of yay high, and this is maybe 14 feet. So you have this massive sort of enclosure of this thing that helps this uh, building disappear, basically. There's no discernible entrance. It really becomes a kind of utility. Uh, two engineers for Google's, uh, one of Google's data centers, they describe it as, as, quote, one massive computer whose chassis happens to look like a warehouse. This is architecture as a computer case. 
But even if we think of these as massive, so let's say think of these as massive computers, they're also uh, massive energy machines. Um, according to a Yale study, responsible data centers in general, not just Walmarts, but data, the data center industry is responsible for 3% of the world's energy consumption and 2% of greenhouse gas emissions. And sure, like 2%, that's not a lot, but that's the, I mean, it is. It's the same amount as the airline industry. So consider that, that the data center industry is producing the, exact, the same amount of greenhouse gas emission as the airline industry. So all of that data, that data hunger, uh, leads to a larger scale of planetary awareness. Walmart tracks all of this data to reduce risk, to anticipate demand, and to discover correlations. So for example, here they proudly point out that they've discovered that when hurricane warnings are issued, people tend to buy a lot of Pop-Tarts. And this is a kind of funny thing, but then also it's, it triggers, think, consider the kind of massive supply chain implications for this. So when the Weather Service issues a hurricane warning, then Walmart calls Kellogg's and says, okay, send down, you know, triple the amount of Pop-Tarts to the affected areas, which then triggers a manufacturing process, which then, which then triggers all of these trucks sending, sending down uh, to the affected area. And all of that is linked to the little barcode on these products that like all those Pop-Tarted, barcoded Pop-Tarts are telling them this is what happens when something like a hurricane warning uh, is issued. So what they realized is they need to be the ones issuing the hurricane warnings, not the weather service. So Walmart has worked with private weather prediction companies to monitor events. And because they don't have a public obligation, they can actually act based on their own needs, which what worked for them really well in Katrina because they were able to, with the, the private weather company they contract with, they could see what was coming and they knew that New Orleans would need to be evacuated. The National Weather Service, of course, has a public obligation not to freak out the city, so they have to wait to be sure, but Walmart knows it can act more quickly. So they did that, they made the call, and they sent all of their trucks into the affected area, partly to make sure supply chains weren't disrupted, but as a result, they were actually able to provide a lot of real relief aid three days uh, earlier than the National Guard. Of course, another side story about um, the administration's response to Katrina, but nonetheless, this became a very kind of emblematic story for Walmart about their nimbleness of their supply chain and it, and it produced for them a, a whole new sector of their business, which is what they call um, business continuity. Uh, this is an a, a image of their disaster response center. So they now have become increasingly um, concerned with planetary dynamics because they know that these things will have significant effects both on their delivery but also their, their sourcing. And it's a logical conclusion of a logistical operation obsessed with data management and control. So data collected from shoppers and warehouses is then relayed through a satellite network and housed in a growing collection of data centers. Um, and you can see the planetary ambition described by this souvenir lapel pin, innocently suggesting um, reach beyond planet Earth. Uh, but the, consider that, that as these atomized bits of data packets are being sent down, from satellites to awaiting data centers. In exchange, their immense cooling systems are sending back a whole series of actual clouds full of atomized bits of carbon and other molecules, uh, which then contributes to a larger planetary transformation. The ninth point is, uh, I only have two more. The, um, this one is actually not about Walmart, this is about Amazon, but it's, it's the kind of frontier in a way of what's happening with these logistical spaces. And it's the way that the logistics logics will actually destabilize architecture. So rather than roaming through miles of racks, as in the Walmart case, Amazon Robotics, which was formerly called Kiva Systems, creates a condition in which workers are stationary and a small robotic drive unit, the orange thing, brings a shelf to someone who's then, who then assembles an order based on um, instructions and puts that into this uh, yellow tote and then sends that on its way to awaiting delivery vehicles. This was purchased by Amazon for $800 million in 2012 and it's become their, um, their kind of one of their largest sites of, of R&D. So what's significant here is um, that once the, sh once the little robot lifts a shelf up and moves it to an awaiting picking station, when it goes back, it doesn't go back to where it came from, it goes back to the, the, most, the first available space they basically describe it as like a bidding system where these, these robots, uh, there's a call and the robots respond and whoever is closest, whoever, whichever is closest, brings the shelf to 
to the, the picker and then goes back to, again to the closest uh, place. And so one of the breakthroughs in the system was to make uh, the storage into independent systems, not giant shelves like the one we saw before, but also to make storage and inventory the same thing and then to make storage mobile. So storage uh, historically was often assumed to be a fixed element of distribution systems. Uh, some storage racks even serve as double duty as actual structural support for their building system. Here uh, is an example where the, the racks actually are the building's structure. Um, the Kiva system, the Amazon robotic system, undoes this by not insisting that storage elements remain static and by animating them with a certain kind of intelligence. Instead of machine buildings populated with robot-like humans, which is a kind of trope of science fiction, Kiva creates a machine landscape of building like robots. And this form of internal communication creates an overall organization in which the racks that are frequently requested tend to move closer to the picking stations, and then um, the ones that are, that are cooler um, tend to move toward the middle. So you can kind of see from a distance this is just kind of like teaming, and these are all the, the small, this is a simulation of all the RDUs basically moving them around. Um, so you might say that the map of this warehouse is a picture of our own collective consumer desire and impulsive quests for fulfillment, but encrypted and presented back to us through a machine language that we don't understand. The noise of this floor is, of course, entirely rational and governed by a series of shepherding algorithms that ensure that every robotic drive unit makes it to a picking station, doesn't smash into another robot, all of that. But from a distance, it just seems like a swarm of little dots. And that's, I think, because we're not equipped to understand what's really happening here. So as logistics becomes automated, its spaces and configurations become opaque, even to those who have designed them. This process, I think, like the process of Walmart developing property remotely and based solely on forecasting data, further abstracts conditions on the ground for those in positions to affect their future. Uh, it's conceivable that this will spill out from the enclosure of the warehouse into our everyday life. So if the barcode, this is another simulation, but just zoomed in, and these are the, the, the oscillating blue and red figures are the people unloading these uh, robots. So if, if the barcode is the language uh, by and for machines, Amazon's automated warehouse floor is that language turned spatial. Like the barcode, the patterns of movement on the floor are governed by algorithms, but are illegible to their human authors. Rather than conforming to an enlightened model of order, as in analog warehouses where everything goes back to where it came from, Amazon's system presents a version of storage governed by the priorities of speed, of flexibility, and frequency of demand. This retrieval process is not registering some kind of entropic erosion, but rather a different level of order, a machine-readable environment underpinned by the language of the barcode. And I really, I think for me, it's hard to underestimate the profundity of this, that the, 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 the foundation of our knowledge is based on the sort of hierarchy and stability of these sort of enlightenment modes. And here, we're sort of challenged with a whole other um, order. And so finally, as a way of concluding, um, this section, the, the second section, the last section is much shorter. Um, logistics reshapes territory. So logistics is the management of things in space and time. Advances in data management allow this to happen faster and faster at a larger scale, so much so that overcoming the planet's shape to ensure continuity becomes a priority. Uh, and that's done with these satellite relays. Um, all of this is in service of faster response times, reduction of risk, and the anticipation of desire, which has created a massive new infrastructural typology on the planet, which is the data center or the server farm, and has fueled a search for even faster shipping routes. So this is a map of the polar regions that shows the red are the current routes. But um, maybe some of you have been following this. In 2018, the Maersk Venta, a container ship, made this journey along the northern coast of Russia from, from Busan to Bremenhaven in 10 days, I'm sorry, it, in 10 days faster than the usual route through the Suez Canal, and it only needed an icebreaker for that part. Usually, it needs an icebreaker for the entire thing, and this is part of the, the terrifying aspect of this. So if you remember at the beginning, UPS suggested that logistics makes the world work better, but I think we might amend that statement. As these logistics corporations shape consumer behavior and produce demand for speed and flexibility, they also produce a massive energy system that accelerates an already accelerating global temperature. 
which in turn makes it easier for to ship things faster by opening up new trade routes and new markets. So you're seeing that happening here. Basically, the, this is the Northwest Passage that people are craving to be able to get goods through. This is the sea ice, and what's significant is the, the amount of white that you see. That's the four-year-old sea ice. So uh, rather than making the world work better, I think we can say that logistics actually makes the world. So finally, as a way of concluding, I have three, um, three projects that, um, that I offer as a way to, to sort of how I've been trying to translate this research into uh, design work. And, and for me, it raised questions of where agency resides, the nature of form, and the possibilities of program, and potentially urbanism. So these are three um, projects that come out of, of this research. Um, the first thing I want to say, though, is just my, my efforts to, to try to make sense of this. It's been a, it's, it's a challenge, I think, but I've been trying to think about how to engage this logistical system. And um, I've been, I like thinking about the idea of, of the, the para-logistical as a way of thinking of a practice. So para in the sense of both parallel, um, you know, operating alongside of something, but also para in the sense of kind of paramilitary, like in prepare, preparedness of something, in anticipation of something. Uh, and this is maybe linked to another strain of response to logistics, which is more um, counter-logistical, uh, more kind of directly resistant, which is also really important. But I've been finding that um, this, for me, from a design point of view, allows for a little bit more um, room to move, I think. And so there's a few kind of notions that I've been trying to develop with my design work. The first is the notion of the paratype, which is a similar to the way that Walmart uses their notion of prototype, uh, something that has a kind of internal logic to it that must be maintained, but then has a looser interface with its contexts. Um, paratypes tend to live in packs, and they rely on their families for uh, being able to work together. Related to that are what I'm calling par forms, kind of like parboiled, like half-baked, half-cooked things, waiting for development, waiting to be deployed, waiting to be instantiated or activated. So if the paratype speaks more to, to organization and arrangement, the par, par form might have more to do with the visible manifestations of a project. And as I said earlier, with logistics, in order to keep their operations lean, an enormous amount of material abundance becomes necessary. This kind of slack is really important for the, for the whole system to work, um, which I think is also ready to be redirected in the form of this kind of residual physicality. And then finally, at the urban level, I think it's possible to think about paralogistical architecture as being somewhere between a building and, a, and an infrastructural system uh, and, and made up of a series of kind of related pieces. And so with that, um, I offer one, this project is ongoing, um, and I've been referring to it as a public facility. Uh, it's a project that asserts that the, the, the nature of a region's infrastructure could be a means to rethink some civic spaces. And it uses the, um, a range of infrastructural types in the New Jersey Meadowlands to, um, to think, to both sort of understand what's going on in this place, but then also to think about how they might become generative for fueling a kind of imagination of what this might uh, be. And I, I'm happy to, some of the folks who've been working on this project with me are, uh, kindly came out to the lecture, so thank you, Zach and Jesse, for coming. Um, so just in case you haven't been to the Meadowlands, you probably have been through it on the train, but it's this um, marshland just across the river that consists of a series of industrial sites, uh, as well as railroad and freeway corridors, and the idea with this project was to look at uh, this area as a kind of metabolic landscape, as a series of inputs and outputs and exchanges. And so we identified a series of elements that operate within these categories. So these are the, the radio towers. Um, this is one of the densest areas of radio broadcast, uh, and it has to do with the brackish water of the area. Uh, we identified the various kinds of tanks and storage facilities, and then finally the, the various landfills. And then are in the process of translating these into a series of broadsheets that are kind of somewhere between uh, an atlas and a field guide, and these will be installed in the path trains that, trans that, that sort of cross over this landscape every day as a way of hopefully uh, inviting people who are on these trains to think about um, what they're seeing out the window. But it also, what I'm hoping comes out of this is a way of foregrounding the kind of uh, latent activity of this place, but also to start seeing what new design uh, elements might emerge. So just these are some of the details of those drawings, the landfills, the towers, and the tanks. And then um, in, in progress are a series of, of design sketches about how small-scale interventions within the language of these latent forms might 
trigger larger scale reorganizations of this place. So something as simple as building a bridge right here would make the entire network available for circulation. But this one piece is missing, and as a result, you can't cross the river, even though this is Secaucus Junction. So all you need to do, if you could just sort of cross over, you'd be able to, to complete this amazing circuit and travel through all these incredible landscapes. But as a result, it's nearly impossible uh, to do that. And this co coincides with the opening, um, apparently, in the few months of the so-called American Dream, which is the largest mall uh, in America, which will be in Secaucus by the ballpark uh, here. So stay tuned. Um, the, this, the, um, related to, to, to this question of sort of finding a language, this is a project for, um, for the Seoul Biennial, um, and it's basically, there were two ideas about it. One was to have one-to-one um, -one pieces of logistics on display, but then also to, um, to challenge, challenge the sort of language of logistics. So the first part has to do with a series of augmentations that pose logistical uh, elements against aspects of everyday life. Uh, to suggest that we are more logistical than we might think through a series of, of much more familiar kinds of augmentations. And then the second part was to look at the volumetric, uh, was to, sorry, to challenge the volumetric definition of logistics um, in order to understand how they work as an infrastructural system. So it takes three components of Walmart's distribution architecture, the ones I just showed you, the data center, the distribution center, and the super center and then reshuffles them to highlight their compatibility, but also to investigate the configurations that might emerge. We called this a kind of um, cadaver schizomatic, and the idea was that this was a kind of um, machine that would make new drawings by just like re reshuffling these, uh, these drawings. And, and because of the compatibility of the, the system, all of these sort of patterns uh, emerged, which then were, are in the process of being translated into some uh, new types. But I think for me, the, the process for this project was the kind of key piece because it was about highlighting the way that these systems are internally coherent, even if they're um, ex opaque from the exterior. Uh, and then finally, this is the last uh, thing I will um, present tonight. This is the, the pr our proposal for the PS1 Young Architects program from last summer. Uh, I'm sorry, summer before, so 2018. Um, and it begins with this recognition that hidden in plain sight, inside all of these warehouses are these dazzling spatial conditions produced by this material abundance, this sort of excess of stuff that is necessary to allow for these systems to be so responsive. So we, we took the, um, the humble pallet rack, which is the sort of building block of all of these warehouses, and realized that it actually is this incredibly robust thing and this incredibly flexible thing that remains somewhat underexplored uh, as a building system. And so. Um, for the PS1 courtyard, the, the idea was to take this, uh, this element and to try to exploit it to create a series of new atmospheres and effects and experiences. We were referring to this as a kind of uh, enchanted forest of logistics. That was at least the, uh, the goal. And I'll let this on play. So the idea um, with this module, we, we became really fascinated with the way that the, the shelf, when, when produced in aggregate, started to dissolve, but also to produce a series of these optical effects when you, when you move around it or move through it. And then it became a powerful organizational tool to start uh, creating the, the, the organization of the courtyard. And we saw, the, we saw this project for PS1 really as a, a public space project, fundamentally, even if the brief was more about the kind of visual identity for the concert series. It was really important uh, for me that, it, that we thought of this as a kind of prototype for a public space. And as a result, uh, the idea was to create um, a series of spaces that were interrelated but would be something that you would discover upon uh, arriving. And so the goal was, uh, that was one goal. The other was to recontextualize this major but invisible part of many people's daily life. So the, it's organized around a series of elements, the, um, the racks, form a grid of aisles and cross aisles, and then selectively removed to create what we are calling clearings. The, um, the stacks are custom pieces of furniture that sit inside the racks, and then the tracks are a series of, of linear elements overhead that form wayfinding and also conduits for the mist and, and light and things like that. Um, 
and then this is the, the ground around which this is surrounded, and then the, the courtyard situation. So these are just the detail of the, the racks and the tracks and the stacks. They're all meant to be off the shelf. What was, what's significant here um, in terms of the metabolism of this project, all of the shelves were donated or were promised for us to be, we were gonna borrow them for the summer. So we weren't really encumbering anything. We were just sort of temporarily holding it and then redirecting it and then putting it back into the, the stream. Um, there's so, they have so many of these available that when we asked for 15,000 square feet worth, they were sort of disappointed. Uh, <laughs> because usually they're, they're accustomed to installing 800,000 square feet warehouses in a week. So, so for them, uh, this was, uh, they were kind to get involved. This company is called Heads Up. Um, they were kind to get involved, and uh, I think they were interested in how, how their work became uh, translated. And I think, like anything, they were interested in, people interested in what they were doing. Um, so I think, again, this, this is a kind of standard system that when aggregated, produces a wide range of effects, uh, conditions and spaces and atmospheres, and then uh, the hope was, like a forest, it would be something that you would discover, that it wouldn't reveal itself right away, that you would, as you entered the space, you would, you would be invited to explore it more deeply, and that this simple system of, of basically three off-the-shelf components could be assembled uh, simply, quickly, but then produce an effect that was greater than just the, the, the pieces. Um, and so these are some examples, some of the custom uh, furniture pieces, that would be inserted into these. And one of the, the things that resulted from the assembly, it was basically, that's like, basically like a table with, with um, 500 legs. And so you could remove bracing up to 10 feet. So all of these things normally would be quite solid, but the effect here would be this thing on really a number of very small points. Um, it would perform at night in a certain way that would be different than the daytime when it would act as a sort of space of, of shelter and shade. And again, the idea for us was that this was meant to be a prototype. These are a series of proposals for other places where it could be deployed. And because of the looseness of the form, it could be quite adaptable, even though there'd be internal consistencies that we would need to maintain. So as a final image, this is uh, the goal of this project was to intervene into the life of a material to create a new set of spaces and experiences that could be discovered individually, but also could be discovered collectively. So that this could be something that could become a kind of generator for a public in a place that might normally just be a place for crowds, but that you might start to find your way through this uh, by coming together with strangers who you might share uh, an enthusiasm with, and this might change the way you might see uh, the place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Jesse. I'm kind of overwhelmed, frankly, by what you've just shown. Um, and I have a couple questions, but then I'm going to open it up to our students and faculty to dive in. So I wanted to sort of build off the last project that you showed, um, because in a way, you, your project at, at PS1 was intentionally kind of carving out spaces within this kind of network of, of racks. Mm -hmm. and, and so I felt like listening to your talk, it wasn't just a talk about urban design. For me, it was like a completely new language and sort of vocabulary lesson about the, you know, the, the, the language that is, frankly, now a main agent in shaping our built environment. I would say words that you did not use were things like streetscapes, <laughs> right? right? Mm -hmm. Storefronts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you used kiwa robots, not mm -hmm. necessarily, you know, neighbors. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, public space. Um, and um, master plan. So, and I feel like these are, this is the sort of vocabulary that perhaps mm -hmm. urban designers, planners, architects have frankly been using to describe our work. And your research kind of turns that on its head. And I think in the, the funny moment in this last, you know, PS1 project, you were kind of, trying to pull some of those things back together. So I guess 
I would just, I mean, my question to you is, you know, on the one hand, what is, what does public space mean in this kind of world? And it, I don't want to say world because it, it's a world that exists, but I don't think it is a world that has a physical imprint in, certainly not my personal mind, um, but potentially in the, the general kind of archetypal urban designer or planner's mind. What, is, what does sort of public space mean in that realm? Um, and, you know, in, in any case, or in any situation, have you kind of taken this research into places or into, you know, place like Johnstown, Johnstown Pennsylvania, where, you, you know, the, the sort of current reaction to Walmart would be like, Walmart killed downtown. And can you just talk about that notion of, of, of public space or the ways that you use or do not use these more kind of conventional words, if you will, and mm -hmm. what we can kind of take home from that. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, it's a, well, it's a, great, um, it's a great question, and I've been thinking about that a lot, and even today in the discussions, a lot of what you know, we were realizing is that so much of, of what we, I mean, this is maybe obvious to everyone, but so much of what we do is conditioned by the way we describe what we do. And so, um, so I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's certainly an effort to try to, um, to, to be, remain sort of distant from some of those more familiar terms, but then also they, they're not so compatible. And I think this is for me one of the things that's both sort of, like on one hand, it's a way of, of, of um, wondering about the state of urban design, like what is that field and how is that changing, um, given that it's always been something that's kind of renegotiated. Um, but then also, in a way, there's not really much space for publicness in these kind of logistical regimes, but I think that's where trying to, to read them as infrastructural becomes useful, because then if we start seeing them as, as infrastructural, then that maybe gives us a way to find entry points. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, right now, I mean, so much of, there's no reason maybe that like a supply chain would be public because it's, they, they exist in the sort of realm of the corporation, but we know that the city, cities rely on supply chains all the time and any kind of infrastructural provision is basically also logistical. So I think that there's, on one hand, there's a, there's a real danger, I think, that these things will become um, you know, privatized beyond control, but then I think there's also opportunities to try to think about how those could become generative. And I think that's where, for me, I guess, the, the hope is to try to find a language for thinking about it that's maybe not logistical, which is not the kind of mode of efficiency. I mean, one of the kind of ways that some of the, the thinking that led to like the PS1 project and the Soul project was to was to, to try to cater, like make a list of all the things that don't benefit from the things that logistics offers, like things that don't get better when they're faster, things that don't that don't improve when you do them more quickly, and those mm -hmm. tended to be kind of human relations, you know, mm -hmm. things like um, mm -hmm. like fundamental things about getting to getting being involved with each other. And I think that's where this sort of civic dimension starts to come in. And I, I think that, I mean, I've been thinking about these other forms of collective civic infrastructure, um, and they all tend to be sort of wrought, fraught because they're linked to questions of like power and, and visibility and, and division and access. But nonetheless, like at some, sometimes there's a kind of monumental dimension that is monumental in like a positive way, not in a kind of assertion of power, but in a way that might Collective is maybe a better way to describe it. Something mm -hmm. that might bring people together around shared as shared aspiration, shared imagination, um, and so I think the question of to like you know what is the what is public space in this context? I mean, on one hand, it's difficult to find in the corporate world, but if one looks at the sort of hi recent history, recent-ish history of public space as it confronts privatization, that's been an ongoing negotiation. So mm -hmm. the and and a losing battle. I mean, I, like the kind of um, there's a court maybe you know this court case from the 70s that was a series of protesters in a mall and they said we, we need to protest here because this is where the public is, even if they're the shopping public. And so I think this is still, so how, how does one translate that to the kind of distributed shopping public of like Amazon um, and what are the possibilities there? And I think this is one of our challenges. And another way to answer it is that one of the reasons that I was interested in Walmart actually is because sometimes the 24 hour super centers are one of the few places that act as a kind of collector mm -hmm. in, in certain towns. And so, so what happens when that sort of small neighborhood uh, Main Street has been sort of overruled by Walmart's cynical calculation that people will seek out economic self-interest over collective benefit? Um, 
then they're left with this kind of 24 hour space to then try to create publicness in somehow. So I think at the end it comes back to a question of value, I think, and where how we can sort of create an argument for value being beyond the economic uh, bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really difficult if you're just trying to survive. So yeah. part of the reason why Walmart is successful is because they understand that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think just, I guess, Building on that a little bit, I, you know, I, I th you know, the the sort of unpacking of the architecture of Walmart too is rather, you know, the idea of that it's content, or content over form, because mm -hmm. I, I do feel like obviously there's been a struggle in in architecture to kind of reinvent and, and kind of find new 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 purpose, new logics around form, whether it's mm -hmm. technique or. I, I guess my I guess my question um, goes also to this issue of housing and the collective, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of what you're showing, I mean, you can think about the architectural manifestation or the urban design manifestation of your lecture, which is kind of mm -hmm. what I'm I'm grappling with as being literally that the study of the form of that super mm -hmm. center or the server farm. Mm -hmm. I think you know I'm wondering if it, it's also or, or if you've looked into the notion of the private house, mm -hmm. or because in a funny way, mm -hmm. the Walmart and Amazon, as you've kind of showed today, it, to some degree it sort of collapses that need mm -hmm. for this middle ground, maybe mm -hmm. this kind of public where the private home becomes something that is, you know, uh, and just the opposite side of the, the dots of the mm -hmm. expanding map. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. could also imagine a kind mm -hmm. of a expanding dot map of, of single family homes mm -hmm. and or, um, uh, you know, is the sort of built fabric that associates with that kind mm -hmm. of form of, of, I guess what is, I don't know, maybe it's a petro, <laughs> petro anti-urban kind of a mm -hmm. building fabric. And mm -hmm. I guess my question is a little bit along the lines of the domestic mm -hmm. um, aspects of that. Mm -hmm. Is there, anything that we can kind of gain, because Columbia is now embarking on a, um, a new research project around the issue of housing, and mm -hmm. I think it's something that you know, has been a, a strength of the school for, for many years, but at the same time, I think we also have a kind of a collective blind spot as to um, mm -hmm. what housing maybe means in this vast portion of, of the American landscape. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just speak a little bit about the relationship of the home or domesticity vis-a-vis mm -hmm. <laughs> -vis some of your, your research? Or have you found um, in this kind of expanding, it looked almost like a measles of, of, mm -hmm. of Walmart stores, um, is there, has there been an expansion of built fabric or are there any other kind of reciprocal impacts on the built environment that, that have kind of, are also harbingers or, or signals of that change? The, the, I think it's a really important link um, because you're right, this is what, I mean, if, if at the end of the day this giant corporation is driven by individual shoppers, um, and if, I mean, as a side, like parenthetical note, like Walmart is much more than like a retailer, but they're, they're mostly a retailer. Amazon is not really a retailer anymore, but the Walmart still kind of is, and so, and it, it, and it's, it is, um, there's this level of coverage to it. You're right. So there's this. Um, the, the I think it's the, the question about what housing looks like for not the kind of dense urban space, mm -hmm. uh, and what would what sort of forms of collectivity might emerge. Uh, and I think this maybe one of the links has to do with the kind of pressures that create form. And so, of course, one of the reasons why all of these distribution centers are giant and flat is because the real estate pressure doesn't need them to be anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's much simpler to move things around horizontally. There are, of course, like ver vertical distribution centers. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of really fascinating, dense things, but they're much more expensive because they're more comple complex. And so here you have a kind of um, horizontality that's bred from the nature of real estate value and technology. And I think that would play a role in, in housing. I mean, I think what um, Walmart's success in the early days was counterintuitive to most people because they thought that you would have to open your store in the town because who's going to shop at the store at the edge of town? Mm -hmm. But they realized that all these people live on the edge of town. And so mm -hmm. this is part of it was that they were able to capture uh, 
people and rely on their own their sort of autonomy. I think that the um, and of course it relies on single family mobility mm -hmm. uh, because you and need to car. drive there. Mm -hmm. And so it, yeah, car. there's something kind of a little bit. Um, I don't know. The irony seems to be lost when Walmart rolls out. It's like sustainable store surrounded by this sort of giant parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, it has been. I mean, I, part of the research has led me to some other places like urban WalMarts, like WalMarts in Shanghai, for example, that are a much different organization. And then they're vertical. They have shuttle buses. So I don't know. I think that the role of of domesticity and consumption, I think, is linked to the way that the notion of the individual is maintained and produced. And so something like Amazon. What they're, they of course want you to be understood, understand yourself as like a unique individual who, who, who there's no one else like you because that's why you're buying what you're buying. And I think that's the notion that you're sort of isolated mm -hmm. is more and more uh, important. So I think this is something to overcome. But I think this is where the kind of consolidation and movement of goods seems mm -hmm. like really an amazingly possible layer to start thinking about housing through the way it connects to these metabolic processes. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that to be absolutely critical kind of trajectory of, of mm -hmm. thought moving forward. Um, and I guess my, my, my last question before opening it up is really about urban design pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you're a teacher, you teach it, and you're an architect. And I guess, you know, I was really taken by your final three projects and this kind of research translation or this mm, reciprocal kind of aspect of research and design that you're you're sort of developing now and what you know what do you think in your in your own teaching methods or, or um, and I know you've taught some workshops here what are some kind of methods that I think you, you that you sort of advocate in your in your sort of pedagogical process um, is it I mean clearly the diagram plays a big role in your your work and the sort of just in terms of the understanding the logistic is there you know are there moments of you know resistance in your, you know, when you're, when you teach, is it about understanding the system? Is it about developing tools to resist the system? Is it about, um, how do you, how do you bring, um, this incredible research into the classroom? The, um, most of the resistance is met, is with the students. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I have amazing students. Um, the, well, I think that the, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is, Part of the the search is is mm -hmm. um, how to be how to help sort of um, support understanding, but then also to 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 sort of understand the implications of that understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one one um, common I think thread uh, is to to try to think about multi-scalarity, mm -hmm. both in terms of size and time. The barcode to the Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> what I was trying to Arctic, sort of like right, rehearse yeah. that mm -hmm. a little bit tonight. And I think that's, that's been really useful. Clear. And I think with the um, the workshop that I did here, which was with Tay um, Carpenter, mm -hmm. and we've also taught some um, other summer workshops that have to do with sort of understanding systems. And those those um, those produce documents. Those, I mean, that's mm -hmm. that part of it is like the drawing becomes a tool to see relationships. I mean, mm -hmm. that all sounds kind of straightforward. I mean, I think that the, um, but I think sort of being a little bit, um, a little bit annoyingly insistent on mm -hmm. maintaining that multi-scalarity, multi I think right, really right, has right. been really, um, for me, illuminating. And then I think, I guess the other, uh, I don't know, personally, my biggest problem as a designer, well, <laughs> there's many, one of them <laughs> is the uh, the ability, the, dis the difficulty of getting outside of, my, of one's own head, basically. Mm -hmm. like how do you, how do you sort of escape your own intuition? And I think that's where, Design pedagogy becomes also a mm -hmm. design methodology, where mm -hmm. basically, you, you, by setting up certain structures for being like heuristic tools, one can become, one can find things out. I mean, you make a lot of, you do a lot of silly things, but then you also find things that are meaningful. So I think that that, I see the role of the kind of design, it's pe like pedagogue as someone who can be the the person to produce that external structure mm -hmm. that might be difficult, you know, if you're in just doing it internally. Um, and I think from the urban design point of view, I think one of the biggest challenges with urban design or architecture is the question of, of simulation. I mean, so much of what we do in architecture is always to, we like make a lot of promises and we say this is what this will be like and then we rely on other people's understanding of what they think it will be like to decide whether it will be like that or not. And I think urban design has that, but it also gets a little bit more um, connected to the role of all the different people involved. And so I think the finding out ways to sort of rehearse mm -hmm. visions that aren't your own, I think is really key. Um, as a sort of you know empathy machine, 
but then also the studio, the, the space of teaching is this incredibly powerful place because you can do things that you might not want to see happen in the world, which is something to right. really embrace, I think, because actually you can Explore. try stuff out. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think yeah, that's, really, yeah. that's really key. Um, but um, I, I say this only um, with, with humility because I'm still trying to figure out all of these kinds of things, and it was really nice to, to mm -hmm. be here today to see all the amazing stuff that you all are doing trying to make sense of this. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an ongoing search for how to, how to keep moving these things forward. And I think that that question of the kind of political engagement, um, I mean, one hopes mm -hmm. that it, 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 through understanding, my, my, I guess my, my sort of, um, I find myself often thinking of this, this passage from a Foucault essay about how curiosity is the kind of key because curiosity both helps you understand the world better, but also understands that the world doesn't have to be like that. And mm -hmm. that you can both be a steward of it, but also can imagine it differently. And mm -hmm. I think this is something that um, yeah, I find that really useful to yeah. think about. That's great. Okay. Okay, I'm going to open it up to some questions from the audience now. Interesting. Uh, it was great to see the historical tracking of Walmart's growth, and, and, and then this great analysis of how logistics works today. Um, I, I'm wondering if you've done any forward future looking projections about how this system changes, especially given, you know, the carbon bubble that we're in mm. and, you know, considering, you know, we might be at the peak stage of e-commerce as people start to wake up to the fact that, you know, this consumer environment is creating so many other problems in our societies and ecologies. So where do you see this going? And, and also, it seems like there's a moment, like, in this research to shame the corporations that you, you're, you're sort of um, leaving by the wayside. Like even in the PS1 thing, like was there an effort to think about public education as part of this? Um, because it seems like there's an enormous opportunity to, to shame Walmart. <laughs> totally unbiased, right? <laughs> um, the, uh, Walmart's get, Walmart, get, Walmart gets sued every hour. Oh uh, wow. I think, uh, <laughs> Luckily they make $4 so, million dollars yeah, every hour I mean, too, I think so. that, um, that's I funny. think it would be an interesting challenge to figure out how to, um, to, to get them to pay attention. Um, so maybe that's a good challenge. <laughs> you know, how, do, how, how do you sort of make enough, how do you, how do you sort of make an impact at that, at that, at that level? Um, I mean, I think, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't look good, you know? Um, but I think that there is, I think you're right, I think that there's a growing awareness of the implications of convenience, and I think that there's a growing awareness of the, the lack of externality, um, but I think there's lots of work to do there still. So I think that, um, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's, there's yeah, I think you're right. I think, I, I, think it's, it's, I think it's about identifying who the powerful agents are and then trying to figure out how to kind of um, have an impact there. I don't know. I'm just thinking of the kind of like studies about um, behavior and corporate responsibility, and I, I think that there's, um, there's a lot, well, uh, let's say, I mean, the, the, the recent, um, Walmart's recent decision to not stock ammo is significant. Yeah. Um, and so these are, um, they have implications. If at, a, at the building scale, for example, and this is a sort of meandering way to answer the question, but I think um, Walmart realized that their fluorescent bulbs and their refrigerated cases were too hot. So they put out a call for proposals for an LED that would meet their specs. And they put out that call for proposals to anyone who wanted to respond. And the, the prize was the Walmart account. And so you can imagine that every LED manufacturer did their best to make the most efficient LED possible. Because mm -hmm. if you exceeded those specs, you would be more likely to get the job. And so one company got it. But as a result, the whole LED industry now has been realigned mm -hmm. because of this one actor. So um, I think that there's, there's a kind of understanding that uh, it's, there's an ethical dimension to it, but for them, like in the case of Walmart, they see that it's also, there's a, there's a kind of bottom line reality that they're able to translate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, the kind of feedback loop around the, whether, how sustainable the kind of, um, this all, it's sustainable not in the sort of environmental sense, but actually just like literally how long it can last. Uh, I think that, I don't know, as we shift from let's say a kind of consumer economy to an experience economy, that is also starting to break down and so I think that as 
as the as as the world's experiences become overexposed, what you know, what will happen? Will people start to seek out these sort of more meaningful things? Um, as a minor plug, my collaboration with Tay uh, and Dan, Tay Young and Chris Wopkin is about values outside of capitalism for the Oslo Triennial. So you can find out uh, more there. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks uh, so much for the uh, wonderful presentation. Um, you showed a, a fascinating uh, uh, footage of uh, a situation in which two sports were being played at the same time. And I was wondering if in that same spirit we can look at uh, Walmart in conjuncture or in, with intersecting uh, with other uh, mm -hmm. forms of retail or commercial activities such as Starbucks or mm -hmm. McDonald's that in itself may not make much might not make much sense, but intersecting it with other phenomena, um, commercial phenomena, something might emerge. Mm -hmm. um, I'm particularly fascinated with Starbucks because it seems to latch onto Walmart's happening, as mm -hmm. if in recognition that there is no life there, so we're going to create it over here, mm -hmm. next to it, mm -hmm. around it, uh, in multiple forms, but also. Uh, McDonald's, uh, which mm -hmm. has renovated its stores into something much fancier than it, it mm -hmm. ever used to be, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was I was wondering if that intersection has uh, entered your mind and if it has entered your analysis as well. Um, I mean, not as much as I, I, I think it could, but I, I, I think the hybrid as a kind of notion is a really key and powerful idea that where, where certain compatibilities find overlaps and that the hybrid is, is could be a way to kind of smuggle in a kind of change agent or even 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 one that seems sort of minor like a like a certain kind of business establishment or something like that but but I think I mean this is where for me the, the work of, of Keller Easterling has been really influential for the way she talks about contagiousness and and the kind of multiplier so Walmart is exactly one of those systems where one imagine that there are 5,000 stores that have other stores attached to them if you can sort of find your way into that that becomes really um, significant but I think that the um, the, the hybrid is also a powerful uh, tool in general because it starts to undermine stable categories and I think that's where, um, where, we, can, where we can start to discover opportunities. But I think also um, along the lines of what you're asking, it's, it's, it's about searching, I think, for um, certain system, like elements within a system, like latencies or something. So I think there's a lot of potential to find, to recover things within these systems. And, and so, I mean, I haven't, well, this is a kind of um, simplified example, but there's an irony and a, a difficult irony in that, that like Amazon's food distribution warehouse is in the middle of like a food desert in northern New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And so um, these companies are, are distributing all, like there's like, as you know, like 25% of food production is sort of deemed unsellable simply because it looks bad or weird or that, and according to what we establish as being bad or weird. And so I think if, if there's a sort of so the fact that that's sort of next to uh, the, this like big logistical distributor is in the middle of a place that, that could really benefit from a lot of more access to fresh food, it seems like that could be one of those examples where two systems could sort of mm -hmm. dovetail. Um, and I, that's, I mean, I love that piece, that sports piece, because it suggests the kind of invention that can occur from just kind of like overlay, overlay yeah. somehow. Yeah. I feel like your first part had two parts. Um, <laughs> Subcategory A. So and the B. first question was about um, like the location of distribution centers and like where, like what what sort of could lead them to be something else. And then the second part was, um, can you ask the second part again? The second part of the, the first part of the second part, <laughs> the one about elements, efficiency elements, and yeah, if the, if the efficiency is related to how integrated you are to the urban fabric. Mm -hmm. I think, well, the public infrastructure question is, um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I think that what, what like, infrastructure tends to, um, like, piggyback on itself. Uh, I mean, you guys who are looking at the, at the distribution of goods uh, mm -hmm. understand already that, like, that conduits for one, like, it's, it's, it's always these sort of media. So, like, a conduit mm -hmm. for one thing is the, is the conduit for the other thing historically. So, like, freeways follow train lines and power lines follow train lines and freeways and then data, data conduits do that mm -hmm. also because once you've started that. So, I think... There's already um, that's already happening, but I think what I think the, the the we should have to think about the inverse more. Like, how do we get more out of these private 
infrastructural mm -hmm. users. So like basically like we're all subsidizing Walmart's success because they use the freeways. Um, and so like compared mm -hmm. to say the railroads, like it, imagine if Walmart built its own freeways, that would be a stranger, weirder, terrifying world. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of what was happening with the railroads. I mean, basically, basically these private companies were like building their own infrastructure. And so, you know, that, I guess there's an entanglement there that is worth trying to think about. Like, how do we, you know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so I don't think it's like so direct that you can say like this element of an infrastructural system can be connected. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm, you get the sense that like my inclination isn't toward a kind of immediate problem solving response. Because definitely there are ways to kind of make, make public infrastructure better through, you know, more tightly calibrated <laughs> information management. But I think it's more for me the, how do we think about this more broadly around what the nature of this stuff is? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know. I think there's 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 some there's some space to sort of overlap. But I guess the question would be like where, what what yeah I don't know how do what do we sort of what gets delivered through, what is public infrastructure anyway these days and how do we start to kind of pay attention to it? Mm -hmm. And I guess that for me one of the things that the, the Kiva example is exciting and scary is that it 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 suggests this like radical flexibility like this radical reorganization mm -hmm. of and right now it's just like shelves, but you could imagine that could sort of scale up or a much more kinetic kind of responsive environment, um, which I guess comes back to the first question. I mean, I think that the, um, the it's, it seems to be mostly about pressure and access and speed, and so um, as long as there's demand for things quickly, that, that will partly govern where these things are. Um, but there's, I think that there's a, I guess there's a relationship between, I haven't figured this out exactly, but there's a relationship between the sort of size of them and their location and the ratio of like the floor to the height, and you could stack them at a certain point, but then it, the more you stack them, the more it becomes preposterous because the trucks have to like, you know, go up and down. But I think that there's, we're starting to see that in, um, you've probably in your travels through goods distribution research have come across all of Amazon's proposals for like airship delivery. And so that whole world Drones. of the kind <laughs> of strange drone <laughs> port world, I think that's something that is something we need to prepare for. I mean, I think this is, this, this is like another uh, level. So I, I think that we're at a point where maybe there's a, we, we, there's an imminent transformation, but there's like a physical infrastructural correlate that hasn't arrived yet in the same way that like the railroads, the freeways did this like a major reorganization. I think we're seeing that through sort of data mm -hmm. infra infrastructure, but not, it's not as visible. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see its manifestations more and more through things like automation and drones and the like. But I'm reluctant to sort of look too far into the future. Right, right. I think we have time for maybe one more one part question. <laughs> um, is there one in the back? I have, I wanna, well, I have lots of questions, but I'll ask you out in the, in the, in the reception, sorry. Hi, uh, I'd like to know if the project for the PS1 has any relation with Nostop not City by Archizoom. It looks uh, theoretically, has a lot in common. I was wondering if it's a coincidence or I didn't hear There's that. Something uh, the question is the relationship to No Stop City. Um, oh. I mean, I'm, I, I owe a lot personally to that project. Um, so, I mean, I think it's just sort of like in my, in my sort of design mm -hmm. blood, I guess, that that was a really influential thing and remains a really mysterious kind of compelling project for its um, difficult position. I think that it's a sort of, uh, you can read it in different ways and I think that's, that's also quite um, powerful. So yeah, I mean, I think that the, um, Certainly, this sort of—I mean, well, I love those that project because it's um, there's a there's an urban proposal to it, and there's a political issue that it engages, but it also has this really amazing representational dimension. You know, like the typewriter drawings, like all that stuff. Like there was this investigation, this like total belief in the power of drawing and the power of design, even if they were also kind of like totally concerned about what it was that they were designing. So I find that sort of model to be really powerful because it says, you know, these things can all happen simultaneously. You, you can be, you can offer a critical project, but still invest in the kind of, like the, the, the magnitude of the drawings effect somehow. Um, so anyway, I would just, I could, should be so lucky that that would be considered. <laughs> Great. Well, I think we'll close there, but thanks so much, Jesse, for, you. for sharing your research. Upends everything for urbanism.